Our topic tonight is the Colombian paradox. Our guest, uh, as you know, is Ambassador Carlos Yeras uh, de la Fuente, uh, who uh, is the son and the nephew of former Colombian presidents. He's been immersed in Colombian uh, affairs, obviously, for a lifetime. Uh, he will give you a description of the circumstances in Colombia. Our images are several, of course. And uh, we're very sympathetic with every nation that is struggling for domestic tranquility, our own included. And we're certainly uh, sympathetic with all nations that are plagued by a drug problem, our own included. And uh, so we, we're especially interested uh, in the views of a thoughtful and experienced and committed public servant of Colombia. The ambassador uh, holds a doctorate in law and the social sciences. He uh, was active as an academician. He was a professor, a dean, a president of a university. He served in the Colombian uh, economy in various ways. He's represented major commercial organizations. He's participated in congresses and conferences in numerous countries. Uh, and he's uh, been a practicing lawyer in the economic field. He also uh, has served as a senior advisor to his government on various occasions. And he's been a journalist, and he's published extensively on economic, uh, maritime, fiscal, and trade issues. The, uh, the problem, as I say, is one that is of enormous interest to us. And we're delighted to be joined uh, by the ambassador this evening, Ambassador Laris. Dr. Bird, President of the Council of Foreign Affairs, members of the Council, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very <coughs> happy to have this occasion to be here with you today and to address the, the Council and all the uh, people uh, gathered here today uh, on the subject of the that I have called the Colombian paradox. And I usually speak of the Colombian paradox because it's one of the few cases, probably it's quite unique in Latin America, where at the same time we have a wonderful and blooming economy and the most difficult problems regarding guerrilla warfare and drug trafficking. And both things go in parallel and both things continue to uh, exist simultaneously. Uh, I can tell you, for example, that yesterday uh, our army was ambushed in the southern part of the country and we had 32 soldiers murdered and 35 wounded. That's only one action, one of the many actions that happened during a normal month in Colombia. And they were ambushed by uh, uh, guerrillas, uh, narco guerrillas, we call them, as they have come to work together with drug traffickers in a way I will explain later on. But this thing that happened yesterday is just something I, I wanted to, to, to mention as I learned this afternoon about it, and it's very sad. Last week we had our uh, police ambushed and we lost 11 police officers in a small village. Uh, on the Atlantic coast. So, as you can see, uh, we have these difficulties. And on the other hand, of course, we were decertified by U.S. government on the basis that we don't cooperate enough in the war against narcotics. Maybe if we double the number of dead people, we might get certified again. Uh, and uh, on the other hand, we can show a wonderful economic performance. If all these things put together are not a paradox, I don't know what would a paradox be. So 
if you allow me, I'll wait. I, I'll begin by speaking of quite a number of bad things, so I can end with the good things, and you'll take home a, best, a better image of Colombia that, than if, that if I do the contrary. I was telling Dr. Bird just now that looking at the New York Times Magazine last Sunday, when they were celebrating the 100 years of this uh, excellent magazine, I found a wonderful piece of news, which I got just to bring to this meeting. It's dated August the 2nd, 1908. And it says, the growing, the growing menace of the use of cocaine. And they say, they, it, it, it says, the cook peddler, said an expert on the drug, is a familiar figure in the back rooms of saloon dives throughout the country. And every red light district has a drugstore which caters especially to the coke and other things. The use of cokes is probably much more widely spread among Negroes than among whites. Heaven dusts, they call it. Young men and girls got hold of it first in a spirit of investigation and curiosity, then to find themselves bound fast to the wheels of the chariot, etc., etc., etc. And this is a column published, as I said before, in August the 2nd, 1908. So when I hear some people saying in Washington that the problem of drug consuming has to do with Latin American countries offering cocaine to the youth in the United States, which is a very sad fact. I always wonder if we began this in 1908, only probably Indians in Peru consumed coca, which they have been consuming for more than 600 years, as a matter of fact, the same as Indians in Bolivia have been doing. In 1982, U.S. government had a study made on the nutritional uh, uh, qualities of, co of coca. And the study, which of course has never been published, but I was told about by one of the botanists that intervened in doing this study, shows that coca is one of the most nutritious vegetables you can find around. And that's the explanation why these very poor Indians in Peru and Bolivia for centuries, even before the discovery of America by Christopher Columbus, could live during weeks only chewing coca leaves. And they could walk at a very high altitude, 3,000 meters, where the capital of Bolivia is, or at uh, Machu Picchu, that it's about 3,300 meters on the sea level, and they could survive and have enough calories to go uh, uh, around only chewing coca leaves. So we have on one hand a very old culture, uh, all the Indian culture based on the consumption of coca. On the other hand, we have a new society, much richer than ours, that got hold of coca many, many years ago. At least I go back to 1908, if I must believe the New York Times Magazine. And then we find that both things began to be put together about 25 years ago. And as from them, uh, sometimes we have cooperated all the country's victims, the, the producers and the consumers, Sometimes we have cooperated successfully. Sometimes we have spent our time po pointing the finger to each other and trying to blame the other on our own faults. And that's what is happening at this time. Uh, the I'm going to refer quite concretely, because it was the latest development, to the certification uh, process which ended on March the 1st um, with very unexpected, very unexpected uh, uh, results. On one hand, we had 
all the producing and intermediate countries certified as models of cooperation. Mexico, Peru, Bolivia, the big growers of coca leaves, the big, the big transit countries uh, of cocaine. They were all certified. Today, fully certified. Today, they are models which we should look at to imitate. Um, on the second hand, Paraguay, peculiarly enough, was considered a country important for the national security of the United States and then was certified for national security reasons. And Colombia, that is the oldest partner of the United States, not only in fighting drugs, but in many things, as I'll tell you later on, was the certified because they needed to, send to, to throw somebody into the tiger's cage. Colombia and the United States are probably the two oldest democracies in the hemisphere. Even if after the United States it was Haiti, the country that, that got independence from France, before we had independence from Spain. And as a matter of fact, uh, we got independence from Spain financed by Haitians, Haitian presidents or dictators at the time. It's a fact that nobody knows, and I'm speaking of 1815, when President Dictator Petion of Haiti financed Simon Bolivar uh, to go back to South America in 1816 and fight the Spanish troops, action which ended in the independence of Colombia, Venezuela, Ecuador, Peru, and Bolivia. But of course, Haiti had obtained independence from France not long before us. It was, we obtained it in 1810 for the first time, but was always a dictatorship. So maybe we are the oldest democracy because not only we got independence as from 1810, but we continued to be a democratic country. And we have had in all of our history only two military dictatorships one in 1853 and the other, peculiarly enough, 100 years later, in 1953. For the rest, we have always had freely, democratically, popularly elected presidents. So we have a long tradition of democracy, which no other country in the continent has. Our political parties, and we have two, as you do here, were born in 1832, and they continue to be the same, called liberals and conservatives, which, from a certain point of view, could correspond to the Democratic and Republican parties in the United States. They have a lot of similarities in certain aspects, or, or at least had a lot of similarities last century. Uh, we have had a parallel, a, a, a parallel development in our democracy. We have, for, except for the time when we lost Panama, uh, the canal to the United States and Panama to Panamanians, fin financed by the United States government at the time. Um, we have had, or we have had, wonderful relations for many years. During Second World War, we declared war on Germany, Japan, Italy, and all the countries uh, that were with uh, allies of the Axe. We put in trust all their goods to avoid them from sending help to their countries. Uh, and uh, we really fought a small war of our own together with the United States. I still remember being very young when President Franklin Delano Roosevelt visited Colombia at the time. Later on, we went with the United States to Korea, and we had a battalion in Korea which fought uh, in a very valiant uh, way. Uh, we had more than 1,000 casualties in Korea with our Colombia battalion. Uh, and uh, in the same way, we have been working with the United States in the organization and functioning of uh, the, all the institutions that came out of Second World War, like uh, the United Nations, 
the International Monetary Fund, the uh, World Bank, etc., etc. And we have been, as I can, uh, as far as I can remember, as I, and as I said before, they are best partner in all uh, activities that have to do with hemispherical development. So to see at a given moment that we are put together uh, in the same group with Libya and Iraq is something that really bothers us and makes me terribly angry and bothers me a lot. I don't think anybody had the right to do so. Uh, not, not only because of past history, but because the year 1995 was the best year in the 25 years we have been fighting drug trafficking uh, in the hemisphere. Never before, in only one year, more than 40% of the, of the crops had been eradicated and destroyed. And never, in only one year, had a whole cartel been put in jail, as it has been the case with the Cali cartel. Never in what year had laws been enacted to stop money laundering. And never in one year so many things had been done, including stopping the, the, the planes coming from Bolivia and Peru through a combined action with the United States through a net of raiders in our southern border in such a way that last year we shot down 12 planes. And that doesn't happen only in Cuba. It happens all around the world. We shot down 12 planes, and we had 30 more landing and captured by our uh, police forces and armed forces. So after all these efforts, you get the certified and sent, as they say here, to the group of pariah countries in which we are supposed to be at this time. With, of course, an enormous difficulty is that the United States had never decertified a friend. So they have been spending quite a number of weeks trying to figure out how to continue being friends and how to continue dealing with us as if we were enemies, both things at the same time. Uh, that makes the relations between both countries extremely difficult to handle because uh, you never know what to do. We had in March the 18th in Cartagena, Colombia, the meeting of ministers of foreign trade. And then we had Ambassador Cantor and late Secretary Brown and uh, the advisor to the President uh, McCarthy and all of our friends going down to Colombia and speaking of how trade in the Americas must grow and how relations between all of our countries must prosper. And on the other hand, we are supposed to be their enemies. Well, they went down to Colombia and nothing happened to them, although it was an enemy country, theoretically speaking. Uh, on the other hand, of course, they must cooperate with us in fighting drugs because it would be quite stupid to stop cooperation. But they don't really know how to do it, because we are enemies and we are not enemies. So uh, I wonder if we are in the same group with Libya, if the United States would be prepared to give weapons to Libya. Probably not. But they are prepared to give weapons to us, because we are fighting drug traffickers. So as you can see, it's quite a peculiar and difficult situation to handle. Uh, that means that we are going through very difficult times very difficult times. The, we have the worst relations we have ever had in history after the Panama Canal uh, incident. And uh, I hope, I hope that after elections in November, things will get better. Because it's uh, a reality that we are a victims of the campaign in the United States. And I say it quite bluntly. Uh, I'm a candid ambassador, which is not a, a, a common thing, but I am. Um, <laughs> all, all of this problem began when Democrats and Republicans decided to find out who was the tougher on drugs. So uh, when President Clinton uh, inaugurated the 104th Cong uh, Congress, in January 1995, 
he forgot to mention drugs as part of the problems or as one of the problems that affected U.S. national security and the United States as a whole. He just forgot. It's not my fault. Probably it's his head of staff or whoever, I don't know, but uh, Colombia had nothing to do with that. But he forgot to mention the fact that drugs were a problem. So as he didn't, uh, Republicans immediately uh, asked for some hearings to be held in Senate. And Mrs. Reagan and uh, Mr. William Bennett and uh, Mr. Olson and Williams and all the people that had worked with Bennett during the Reagan regime and the Bush regime went to Congress and gave st uh, participated in, this <coughs> in these hearings showing how as from the beginning of the Clinton administration, consumption of drugs had increased, and even worse, it had attained uh, younger people. If you look at statistics published by the Washington Post, in 1990, only, and it's high enough, but only 24% of 10th graders had had any access to drugs. Last year, 35% of 10th graders have, uh, had access to drugs. And that's extremely sad, extremely sad. But then this, this fight has been going on. And then the, there came two wonderful opportunities for government to prove that they were tough. The first one was the appointment of General McCaffrey, uh, which I uh, I really like very much, and I think it was a wise decision of President Clinton. But appointing General McCaffrey on the occasion of the inauguration of Congress this year was a way of showing uh, that uh, government is really interested in fighting drugs. And the second thing was certifi the certification uh, process, and they needed to show something. So as the United States have NAFTA, and uh, they cannot sanction Mexico because they are linked by an international treaty in which Canada is also a party. So they can do a thing with Mexico. And of course, the administration was not interested in discussing again NAFTA and the 20 billion that have been lent by US to Mexico. And Mexicans that are very clever, and I admire them, came down. Their minister came to Washington and said, well, if you harm us, we won't be able to pay you the 20 billion we owe. It's a good argument. I, 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 I really envy the Mexicans for having that wonderful and convincing argument. Uh, well, I, that I heard from the Mexican ambassador. So uh, the the... People said, yes, we should certify Mexico, really. 20 billion is worth a certification, and they were fully certified. Uh, when I have the feeling, or I, my suspicion, is that corruption and drug trafficking in Mexico, if not worse than Colombia, is at least equal. I don't know. I, I, I could say it's worse, but I have a big admiration for Mexico. And uh, <laughs> I lived there in exile for some years. Uh, in 52, so I'm not going to say it's worse, but at least it's equal. Uh, and then Peru, the Peruvian ambassador almost fainted when he knew he had been fully certified. Uh, he was not expecting it. He had told me he would never be because they have not eradicated uh, more than 1,000 hectares of, of uh, coca, whilst we have eradicated 28,000 through air spraying in a joint program with the United States. So to, to protect the Mexican certification, they put all, everybody in the group of good countries. And, but they needed to, 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 to throw somebody to the Tigers because they have a Republican Congress and they have been discussing who, if the government is tough enough or not. So they said, who should we throw to the Tigers? Who is the most vulnerable country? And they found, of course, that Colombia is going through a very complicated political situation. There are accusations of corruption that go up to the president of Colombia. His campaign is being investigated as having received money from drug traffickers. He has been accused of that, and Congress is investigating the president himself. Ministers have been investigated. We have eight or nine members of Congress in jail. Uh, and. Uh, 
Some people like me, we hope to have more in jail because our Congress is really rather corrupted, I must say. Uh, so uh, they said, well, the most vulnerable country, the country that has more difficulties to, 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 to protest against this measure of ours is Colombia. Let's throw it to the Tigers, and they did. Uh, so today we are half friends, half enemies. Uh, so I really don't know exactly if I'm representing a friendly country or I'm representing an enemy country in the United States. That makes my life very complicated, as you can imagine. Uh, one of the consequences of the certification at this time is, for example, stopping military aid. And after the short stories I told you at the beginning, about people getting killed in Colombia today and last week. Stopping military aid seems to be quite a complicity with murder and complicity of the United States with communist guerrillas. We are the only country in the hemisphere that still has very strong Marxist guerrillas. We must have today at least 10,000 men heavily armed with very modern weapons, better armed than our uh, army itself. And as they were organized at the time by Fidel Castro, as from 1960, and they got all the money and sustained from Russia uh, and sometimes from China through Cuba. Uh, they lived happily and prospered until uh, the Soviet Union collapsed as from then, they have been uh, obliged to be self-sufficient, which means that they are kidnapping more, they are attacking villages and robbing banks more, and they are selling protection to drug traffickers and participating directly in drug trafficking. So everything that weakens our army not only leaves the honest people of Colombia in the hands of these murderous guerrillas, but also weakens our efforts to fight drug trafficking. So it's another uh, small paradox that uh, at the same time that we are going through these very difficult times, uh, the United States might feel tempted to stop uh, all foreign aid for fighting guerrillas and narco guerrillas and on directly drug trafficking because of the thing, of the uh, of the facts I've told you about and that's the problem you know when you decide to be unfair with your friends you have those difficulties and either you can make life worse for your friends harming your friendship in a way that nobody knows uh, wh which will be the consequences at the end or maybe they'll try after November to do something to restructure and reconstruct and rebuild relations between both countries. So that's how the situation stands today. We have, besides all this history of violence in Colombia, is something that if I had time, I would tell you about at length. <coughs> But we have a long history of violence that, that goes back to uh, last century. Uh, last century, we had five bloody civil wars. Uh, while you had one, we had five. And I always ask my American friends what would they think uh, if they think that this country would be the same if instead of having one war in 1861, you would have had five. We did have five. And all the time, of course, it was fighting for democracy. Because uh, we had last century the country divided between people, conservative party, that thought that the country should be organized as a centralized country, following the French model, and the liberal party that thought that the country should be organized as a federal country following the Philadelphia Constitution model. So they killed each other during the whole century fighting for centralism and federalism. 
And uh, the result is that at the end, in the last war in 1899, when Theodore Roosevelt saw that we were going through the Sixth Civil War, he said, well, it's, it, it seems to be a convenient moment to get hold of the Panama Canal, and he did. And we were in the middle of another civil war. Then in, on the 9th of April, 1948, that means 48 years ago, the presidential candidate for the Liberal Party was murdered in Bogota. Half of Bogota was burned during that week. And a second wave of violence began. And that violence has never stopped since 1948. And that's something people don't know and bureaucrats don't study. That began in 1948. We had the first guerrillas in 1948 as liberal guerrillas that subsisted until 58 when they surrendered and were reborn in 1960 when Fidel Castro took good care of reorganizing them and putting them to, to work at his service and the Soviet Union service. So we have a long history of violence and since 48 up to now, maybe we can speak of five years of peace, not more than that. All of my children, my four children, were born after 1960. And I could assure that none of them has lived one day of peace, as from 1960 until today. Because the years we can call peaceful in Colombia could be 19, from 1957 to 1960, and uh, maybe a, a few a few years, in, probably in 61, probably. But that's all. For the rest, we haven't had one day of peace in the last 48 years. So this, this means something and has a lot to do with drug trafficking. Why? Because as we have had guerrillas for 48 years, the state lose control of the of great part of the country the most far away parts of the country where uh, our army couldn't get in without fighting a battle every time. And those are the regions where drug traffickers found they could plant coca and poppy and they could have their crops because this part of the country, or the eastern part of the country, was not under the control of our arms, uh, of, of our armed forces. And that's where drug traffickers planted their crops and where guerrillas are today. And guerrillas are putting landmines around uh, laboratories and plantations. And guerrillas are shooting down our planes that are uh, spraying uh, with herbicides, uh, coca crops. And we have to send armored helicopters to fight guerrillas before we can send the police in to destroy laboratories and airstrips. So life is very hard, and I can tell you because I've suffered it. I've been in exile, my house has been bombed, uh, and I have had three or four good bombings uh, near my house, which I have had, uh, I've been obliged to evacuate several times. So, uh, as you know also, in the last 25 years, we have had the, the worst amount of casualties you can find in any drug war around the world. We have lost, as you know, half of the justices of the Supreme Court murdered, and half of the justice of the Council of State and the Attorney General and three presidential candidates and more than 375 journalists and more than 500 judges and more than 4,000 police officers all of them murdered by uh, drug traffickers. So we have paid a terribly high price for this terrible war that hasn't led yet to any place because the situation continues to be serious, consumption grows, and business flourish. According to The Economist, the drug business around the world is worth $500 billion. And from that money, According to calculations, one billion and a half comes into Colombia every year in cash. 
plus about two billion in goods smuggled in from the United States and Panama mainly, Japan via Panama, cigarettes, uh, electrical appliances, and other things through which drug traffickers launder their money. So we get about four thousand billion, uh, sorry, four billion dollars, and there are still four hundred and ninety-six billion that are turning around in the world, and probably in developed and industrialized countries because they, we don't see them in our countries. So the fact is that the proceeds of drug have not benefited Colombia in any way. We have, on one hand, we have to take measures to control the bad effect of this money coming in to avoid um, our, uh, to, to avoid the appreciation of, of our currency, because having our currency appreciated would destroy our exports. On the other hand, we, have, we are flooded by smuggled goods to a, to a point that, ridiculously, ridiculously enough, in today's world, last year we have to bring down taxes on imported cigarettes to fight smuggled-in cigarettes. If you look at statistics today, you'll find that in Aruba, each citizen, including babies, consume about uh, 400 packs per day. Uh, and of course, that sounds rather peculiar, but nobody has wanted to follow the way in which all the cigarettes sent from the United States to Aruba then get into Colombia and are sold at every red light in all the cities of the country. And that means millions and millions of pesos on which importers, brackets, are not paying any taxes. And they, they have destroyed our tobacco industry and, of course, legal imports of tobacco. The same thing happens with electrical appliances. I myself was in the board of directors of Philips, Philips Netherlands in Colombia, and we had to just close our factory of TV sets because we couldn't compete with all TVs that were smuggled in from Japan through Panama by uh, drug traffickers that were uh, laundering their proceeds. So the, the, this money that some people think, well, the country is benefiting from drug money, we are not benefiting from anything from the point of view of economy. And from the point of view of morals, it's even worse, because all this money has corrupted the country to an extent that will take probably one or two generations to go back to the old country in which I sometimes think I live, and it seems I don't, the old country that was ruled by morals and principles. A country where people could kill each other in civil wars, but they were defending principles. They were not defending business and dirty business as drug trafficking are. But then, what do we have on the other hand? And that's the 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 other the the, the, the aspect that completes what I, completes what I call the paradox. We have that the conservative and excellent handling of our economy in the last 30 years has allowed Colombia to prosper in such a way that even after the certification, we were certified by the financial companies in New York in a, at a very, very high degree. Standard & Poor's increased our certification, as a matter of fact. In Japan, we have the best certification possible as countries that are safe for foreign investment. Uh, the country has grown since 1965 until today continuously, including the decade of the 80s that was called for the whole of Latin America the lost decade. All countries had a negative growth, whilst we have an average positive growth of 3.2% per, of our gross domestic income. income. So last year we had 5.5 increase of our GDP. And this year, we expect to have five. And next year, we expect to go up to 6% uh, increase in our GDP. 
The the per, per, per capita income, of course, has got much better. And not only that, but the distribution is better today. So it seems that fighting poverty begins to have certain effects in uh, on our population. When all countries in South America during the decade of the 80s had to restructure their foreign debt or defaulted, we didn't. We never restructured foreign debt and we never defaulted. On the other hand, when they were going through hyperinflation, that in some cases went over 2,000% per year, we had a maximum of 32.5% inflation. So all the conditions in the country are uh, the best. Uh, our rate of growth is excellent. The economic situation is excellent. And with the United States, we have received, or we are receiving, 60% uh, of all our foreign investment from the United States, 40% of our foreign trade, imports and exports, is with the United States. Our trade with the United States has more than doubled in the last three years. And today, it has a total value of about $9 billion, coming from $4 billion in 1991. So the, the economic relations between both countries had really uh, f f uh, 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 increased in an excellent and wonderful way. Every day we see more interest from the United States in participating in our economy. And as uh, probably you know, we have now some of the richest oil fields in the world, which uh, the biggest, at least after the Alaska discoveries, uh, which makes of Colombia a country of uh, enormous strategic interest for the, for the hemisphere and especially for the United States. The very sweet oil that you have to import from the Far East, now you can, and you are importing the whole of it from Colombia, and we will continue to, we double the production from last year to this year, and we will double it again next year through the fields that have been discovered by British Petroleum, Triton, uh, now Exxon is exploring again, and quite a number of foreign investors, which at the same time allow us to finance our current account deficit in a, to a very long term based on uh, long term foreign investment. That means that Colombian economy is sound, that the country is growing in an excellent way, and that the two best eco economies in the continent and the hemisphere today, undoubtedly, are Chile and Colombia. By far, in a much better shape than Brazil, Mexico, Venezuela, or any other country in the hemisphere. So what I see, and I'm forgetting at this time that at, for the time being we are enemies, but I hope we will be friends again. Um, what I see now is that the, if, the, if Congress, probably after November, approves the fast track for Chile to be able to negotiate its entrance to NAFTA, the next, uh, the next uh, candidate for entering NAFTA would be Colombia because it has the best economic conditions after Chile. And as I say, by far, by far, much better than Mexico, Brazil, Argentina, and any other country in the whole hemisphere. We are working on the Summit of the Americas. We are trying to develop this free trade zone for year 2005 between, among all the countries of the hemisphere. We are interested in year 2005, but sometimes I think it's too far away. And uh, I would say that having 40% of our foreign trade with the United States would indicate that we should reinforce our uh, commercial uh, links with the United States, which seems just natural. We have, in comparison with this 40%, we have 1.8% of our trade with Mercosur, that's Argentina, Brazil, Paraguay, and Uruguay. We have 25% with the European Union. So no doubt, because of uh, historical and uh, geopolitical circumstances, our, our future seems to be linked to the United States, and both countries probably will continue and have to continue developing jointly. 
I'm sorry I took a long time and I didn't have time to explain a third of it. You can see the situation is complicated, it's difficult to summarize it, I excuse myself, but I hope that this intervention has been made possible for most of you, uh, because the others probably knew about it a lot, but uh, I hope to have contributed to the best knowledge of the present situation, and I hope that in a very near future I can, without making any reservations, assure you that you have a, a, a visiting ambassador from a friendly country. Thank you very much. Ambassador had made me promise before he began that in about 30 or 35 minutes I would interrupt him through some dramatic fashion, uh, but I think it was better that I didn't. I think it's a powerful and interesting argument which he's made. Two questions. One has to do with extradition. Um, how long is it, uh, ha has Colombia not uh, extradited its uh, people, and uh, why not? And then secondly, the Panama Canal, what impact does its uh, uh, ownership now by Panama have on Colombia. Extradition was banned in the co on the occasion of the constitutional reform of 1991. I was myself a member of the Constitutional Assembly that was popularly elected to reform the old constitution of 1886. Unfortunately, the one of the points that was raised at the time was the banning of extradition for nationals. Uh, I'm sorry, I'll have to, to, to extend a little bit in, in my reply because it's a little bit complicated too. On the occasion of the, of the meeting of the General Assembly, government at the time signed a peace treaty with four uh, subversive groups that guerrilla warfare that represented at the time 4,500 people. Those are 4,500 uh, 4, less than we have now. But uh, there were four groups that conditioned their surrender uh, to the fact that they could participate in the elections for members of the Constitutional Assembly. They surrendered and they participated in popular elections and they got 25 places out of 70. So I must, um, I must say it was a very strong group. That group was uh, homogeneously against uh, extradition. On the other hand, there were, I suppose, about five members of the assembly that had been financed by the Medellin and the Cali cartel, and they had got elected. So I would say that there was a basic force of about 30 out of 70 members of the Constitutional Assembly that were beforehand prepared to ban extradition. Uh, two years before the Assembly, President Barco, the former president, had tried to have a reform of the Constitution approved, and the, when extradition was proposed by Senator, um, I forgot his name now, uh, he was murdered two days after uh, coming out of, of Congress. Uh, so, as you can imagine, discussing extradition with television uh, uh, in the room, showing to all the country who was against and who was uh, in favor of people getting letters. I myself got a letter from the Medellin cartel in which they said very uh, nicely, they said, you know, the sons of former presidents also get killed. That was part of the, fi the final part of the letter, <laughs> which was rather inspiring. I must say I, vo I voted against banning his tradition, uh, and I got an armored car le lent from a friend of mine, uh, in which I went around town for all the time. The assembly was on in, se in sessions. So it was uh, very difficult to stop, extremely difficult to stop. People had theories that Germans don't extradite their people, that the, uh, 
Israelis don't extradite their people, never. And, and uh, uh, why should we extradite Colombians? So we do extradite foreigners. We don't extradite Colombians. And the origin was the General Assembly. And as you can see, this group of subversive and former guerrilla members and people that had been financed by drug traffickers were very, very strong, and they got, they got the 38 votes that were necessary to ban extradition, and they did. Uh, this uh, president of uh, Senator Estrada, having been murdered for proposing keeping extradition in the Constitution, had a lot of to do. People were frightened. Sessions were being televised. I went to visit President Gaviria, who is today the Secretary General of the OAS. And uh, I went with a former ambassador to Washington, Alvaro Gomez, who was murdered two months ago in Bogota by these same forces. And we went together, both of us. We, we were in the same group in the assembly. He was conservative, I am liberal. But we had a bipartisan group. So we went together and said, OK, President Gaviria, uh, uh, extradition is going to be banned. What are we to do? You have two ways. One. Just accept the fact, because we know they have the votes to, to ban extradition. The other way is to dissolve the General Assembly and don't have a reform of the Constitution. If, you, if, if we go ahead, we will have the extradition being banned from Colombian law. President Gaviria said, well, I can't do a thing about that. I cannot protect you. You are too many. You are 70. And with your wives and parents and children and sisters and brothers, I would need a whole army to protect your lives. So it's a risk you have to take if I know it's a risk, because in Colombia we are very serious on these matters. When uh, a cartel tells they are going to kill you, they do. It's, uh, it's a serious country. So um, I, 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 cannot, I, I don't have the means to protect you. So you'll see it's, it's your problem, not mine. I'm not going to, to dissolve the, the assembly because we, in fact, have, uh, uh, have you were elected by the people with the mandate to, to reform the Constitution, and you have to do that. So let's see what happens. Of course, what happened is that it was banned. And that's the reason why, since 1991, we don't extradite Colombians, and it's a pity because our uh, penal code is very lenient, and we don't have the sentences are not strong enough. We are working on that. We at least should triple sentences to have these people in jail for the years they deserve. Uh, and uh, our jails are not safe enough. Uh, one of the kingpins of the Cali cartel escaped three months ago. He was shot by the police a month later. But anyway, he's, he, he escaped. Uh, so I would love to send all of them up here. That's, uh, 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 and uh, I am sure Mrs. Reno will enjoy it too. She has told me so. But um, it's, it's impossible, and it would need to reform the Constitution. And it needs the political decision to, and a Congress that will be brave enough to introduce uh, extradition again without knowing if that fact will light again all the violence and terrorism uh, which we suffered in the past. And the second aspect is the, the consequences of, of the Panama Canal being turned back to Panama. Um, I, I know, as you do, that the Panamanian and the U.S. government have been discussing the possibility of the United States maintaining some uh, uh, <coughs> intervention in the operation of the Panama Canal. Uh, and I must say, I think it's extremely important because probably the two countries that are more interested in the functioning of the Panama Canal are the United States and Colombia because we are the two countries that have coasts on both oceans. And we have to, to have our, our ships co going from the west coast to the east coast and back uh, every day just to, 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 to supply 
uh, we have to send from the East Coast a lot of supplies to the West Coast, uh, Col Colombian West Coast, which is very poor. So we need the Panama Canal to, to, to maintain a high, high level of performance. So when I heard that uh, this was being discussed, I must say I really liked it, and I think it would be an excellent idea if Panama would contract with the United States the technical operation of the Panama Canal without any political repercussion for, for the country. And I have the feeling that maybe it will get there because Panamanians found that losing all the American bases and losing all the personnel that's there will cause a tremendous social problem. The, in, in, uh, they will have unemployment and they, ha they will have a lot of difficulties. And on the other hand, sometimes I do fear that the technical operation of the canal uh, maybe would suffer uh, in the hands of Panamanians that eventually would, up, would have political appointees uh, handling different technical aspects of the Panama uh, Canal, and that will hurt so much Colombian economy that as long as it's necessary, I hope that the United States can maintain their presence in Panama. On behalf of a not unfriendly audience, uh, we thank you very, very much.